The New York Times op-ed columnist and author Charles Blow has penned a new book. It's called The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto. It's a roadmap for overturning white supremacy, he says. He has moved to Atlanta, Georgia, after living in New York for 25 years, and he's now proposing that other black Americans up north do the same to boost their political power in key southern cities. Here's our Hari Srinivasan talking to him about why now and how it would work in practice. Christian, thanks. Charles Blow, thanks for joining us. The majority of the book is outlining an idea that is not a thought experiment for you, you're living it. Explain the proposition. The proposition is simply to return to the places where you were majorities or large percentages of the population to consolidate political power. Before the Great Migration, 90% of all Black people lived in the American South. At the end of the Civil War, three Southern states were majority Black. Uh, another three were within four percentage points of being majority Black. Every Southern state had large Black populations. If Black people had not uh, migrated, which is a big if, and if there, there was still the passage of the civil rights uh, legislation and the voting rights legislation, another big if, uh, it is conceivable that Black people today would uh, control up to 14 sentences. They could control um, more electoral college votes than New York State and California combined. Um, they, if they vote, voted over that same period the way they vote today, there would not have been a Republican president in the last 50 years. That would mean that the, the, the Supreme Court would look completely different. I don't think there's a, a justice on it who was appointed over 50 years ago. Uh, this is a, you know, it would, it would have been a major shift in power and it can still be. The only thing that Black people have to do and not even all of them have to do this. But large numbers have to do what many, what smaller numbers are already doing, which is to return to the South. You want people to come back to the South in order to be able to exercise their political power better than what they have in the North, right? Absolutely. There is no real power, political power, that Black people have in the Northern states. How is that possible? We've, we've, we've. What does that mean? This is this is one of the the premises of the migration out of the South was, you know what, it's going to be better in the North. How is it that they don't have political power in New York or in California or in Minnesota? Because they're all diluted. So the black percentage of, of California is about five percent. Uh, black percent of New York is about fifteen percent. Same in Illinois. Uh, so you are not going to deliver a state. You can be the additive uh, group when white people basically split down the middle, but you can't deliver a state on your own. You can't elect a senator on your own. New York has never had a black senator. Uh, New York, black New Yorkers have never delivered New York. It's still going to be blue whether black people are there or not. And and that mean, and that is with New York City having two million black people in it, more black people than any other city in America, and yet. They can't produce, right? So you, you, they can't elect a black governor. There's only been one black governor, and that was because he was lieutenant governor when the, the actual governor got caught in a prostitution scandal. Uh, no black senators. The last two million people in the city, the, we've only had one black mayor in the entire history of the city of New York, and that was 30 years ago. And behind him came Rudy Giuliani, who was who, whose tactics, who used racist tactics, and, and uh, Michael Bloomberg, who, who uh, was a champion of stopping prison. You know, at the surface, when someone looks at an idea like this, they're going to say, well, this is sort of the new Garvey. He, is, he, is he calling for black supremacy? Is he giving up on integration? Is this about yeah. self-segregation? Well, I would turn that glove inside out. For the last 90 years, every state in America except Hawaii has been majority white. No one says that that's a problem for integration or diversity. Uh, right now, as we speak, seven um, states in America are 90 plus percent white. Is that not white uh, supremacy or white majority or overwhelming? Is that not a problem for diversity? There are 40 million black people. There are only 10 million people in the entire, if you collect all those people, those seven states together, it's 10 million people. There are four times as many black people in America. 
than in those those seven states. But black people don't control only one senate, black black senator, two senate seats. Also, if it's also elected by a, a coalition where black people were the majority. Uh, but how is that possible? Those people represent what about three percent of the American population, but they control four senators, and they're ninety plus percent white. People can't ask me questions about whether or not this is a problem ra about racial concentration and racial power until they deal with those seven states. Well, let's talk a little bit about sort of, let's say, brass tacks, right? So let's say, okay, all right, I'm signing up. Now I'm thinking to myself, what sort of incentives are there? What sort of economic opportunity is in the South? I mean, do we have... Have we kind of frozen our idea of what the South is? Because one of the hesitations that people have is, I don't want to go to the South. Well, it's more racist there. There's less jobs there, et cetera. You've been diving into the data for all your research. What did you find? Well, uh, Forbes does a list, uh, I think, every year. Definitely, you know, I took was 2018, but that's when I started writing the book. Places where the black middle class is thriving. Half of that list is cities in the South. When uh, researchers look at where uh, black where black owned businesses are most concentrated, the, the number one region for that is the Southeast. When you look at real gains in um, median family income, the South uh, ranks at the top of that list on and on and on. Uh, the black middle class is actually thriving in the South. Um, th uh, the other thing is about racism. Well, I ask people uh, at the imp Project Implicit, which studies uh, implicit bias during population, they've done like hundreds of thousands of these online tests. I've asked them to cut their data to show me uh, racial bias, what they track is anti-black, pro-white biases. Um, show me those biases by region and by race. Very simple request. It was surprising to even them. There was no difference in the, in the amount of racial bias among white people from the South and those in the North and those in the Midwest, none. You know, there's a, a quote in your book that says, the supposed egalitarianism of northern cities is more veneer than core doctrine. It's a flimsy disguise for a racism and white supremacy that diverges from its southern counterparts only in style, not substance. Explain that. Well, uh, when I look at uh, the militarizing of the police, that is a northern and western city phenomenon, the supposedly um, uh, liberal cities. Right, the the you got the SWAT team from California because they were responding in part to the Black Panthers. That was the first SWAT team. Uh, if I look at uh, stop and first, that didn't start in Greensboro or Birmingham or Jackson, Mississippi or Little Rock, Arkansas. That starts in New York, exported to California and uh, Los Angeles and uh, Chicago. If I look at every police department right now that is under a consent decree with the Department of Justice because they have misbehaved and have violated people's civil rights. Only two of those are in the South. All the rest are in Northern and Western cities. The data, I, I don't understand why the people don't actually look at the data. When, when I look, you know, people look at incarceration rate. Mass incarceration is a huge issue for a lot of African-Americans. Uh, they always point to the South and say they incarcerate a lot of people. Yeah, but they also incarcerate a lot of white people. What you have to do is look at it and say, of the number of black people that you have, what percentage of those do you incarcerate? And when you do it per capita, the Southern states rarely even rank. Vermont is at the top of that list for black men. You brought up Vermont. That's interesting. In the book, you point out that Vermont is the result today of a rather drastic and short migration that began there, um, not dissimilar to what you're talking about, really, from an article in Playboy. Absolutely, and that was part of my inspiration for this book, because it worked so well. And, and during the Vietnam War, uh, uh, early 70s, um, young hippies were uh, liberals, I don't want to call every, all of them hippies, but a lot of them were, it was not a derogatory term, uh, were uh, protesting against the war, protesting against the way Nixon was executing the war. But he was not budging. He was actually, he would, he continued to execute it the way he wanted to. Two young uh, Yale law students um, wrote an article in the Yale Law Review 
that that said, you know, you you can't you're not get anywhere this way. You can't have any kind of armed res- re- revolution, but you can do this thing we call radical federalism, which is to basically go move to a small state, take it over. Uh, one of the smallest states, Vermont. It doesn't take as many people. Move, uh, and it kind of languished there for a, a few months until a writer picked it up and wrote an article in Playboy. And yes, people used to read Playboy for the articles because there were a lot of great writers uh, writing in Playboy. And he wrote an article under the title Take Over Vermont. And after that, thousands, tens of thousands of young white hippies grabbed their things and moved to Vermont. And some of them didn't have places to stay, they slept in the fields, they created communes. But they transformed Vermont from one of the uh, most more conservative states in the union to now it is the most one of the most liberal states in America. It is where you get a Bernie Sanders. It is where Barack Obama gets his highest percentage of the white vote in 2008. They basically changed Vermont from New Hampshire into Vermont. And that is the power of migration. We are not in the era of Jim Crow. We've repealed many of those rules. Why do we need now this influx of black Americans to move to these places and what impact will that have? Isn't the system working? It's not working. We have not repealed those rules. We've 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 uh, forced the people who want the same rules to reinvent them in a more elegant form. We still have massive uh, 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 voter suppression. It's just in a different form. It's not a poll tax or it's not a literacy test, but it is you know all of the things that is happening right now in Georgia in response to the fact that black people were the majority of that coalition that delivered the state for Democrat. And now they're introducing bill after bill in the state legislature here in Georgia, trying to say, uh, get rid of uh, uh, no, uh, no reason um, uh, early voting or require two forms of voter ID, anything that they can do to make it more difficult for people to cast a ballot is exactly what they're going to do. And they know, and I know, and you know, that that disproportionately affects Black people, brown people, college students, and the elderly who are poor. Uh, it is not that these things have gone away. And as long as you you have state legislatures who, that are hostile to you, and that exists some in, in many ways across the country, hostile to you, you will never be free. Charles, you're also making right now in your last answer the case against moving to Atlanta or to Georgia, saying, hey, just we, even if we have more black people here, that doesn't mean racism stops. That doesn't mean the, uh, uh, attempts to disenfranchise me stop. I don't think that's an argument against it at all. If I'm not promising anybody uh, a utopia. If, if racial majorities and control of state power guaranteed utopias, every white person in America would be prospering because for the last 90 years, they've controlled the majority of the states of Hawaii. But they're not all prospering. There's still crime. There's still poverty. There's still income inequality. There's still food insecurity. Those seven states that I mentioned to you, 90 plus percent white, surely all those white people are prospering. No, they're not. They're human beings. They have uh, problems that, 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 uh, uh, that accompany the human condition. If you go to the South and create and, and by chance have a black majority, you will also still have the problems that accompany the human condition. There's no such thing as a, human, uh, as a utopia when human beings are involved. It is just that in the aggregate, people who um, uh, don't have to live under white supremacy are going to do better than those who do. And this is the only way for you to not have a space in this country legally, constitutionally, where you do not have to live under a system of white supremacy. Look, are you assuming that all black people will vote the same way? I mean, look, look at the elections in the last two cycles. I mean, you had large numbers of Hispanics, Asians, black Americans vote for Trump. I am not assuming that at all. And and what I am very uh, uh, careful to say and want to be very clear about in all my interviews is black power is not political party power. I am not advocating black power for Democrats or so the Democrats will have more of an advantage or black power so the Republicans can get a foothold. Black power is for black people to not live under white supremacy, whatever uh, form that takes. You know, a hundred years ago, if you walked into any room in America, the majority of the black people in that room would have been Republicans. Democrats were the party 
of the racists. Clear and simple, no doubt about it, the Klan and everything else. But the Democratic Party reformed itself, changed itself, and Black people over the course of a century forgave the fact that they were the party of the Klan. You could have a future in which the Republican Party no longer sees a, a viable path to uh, national election and then starts to court Black people the same way that the Democratic Party started to do. I don't know what the future holds on the political party front. Right now, the Republican Party, in my opinion, courts the races, which is a non-starter for Black people. They just can't get with it. Uh, uh, but I don't know if that's be the future, but Black power exists separately from a, a, a total alignment with any particular, particular party. So lay out uh, the distinctions between your proposal, which you say is based on anti-racism, pro-blackness. How is that distinct from black supremacy? How is the entire idea not racist on its face? Again, I go back to this idea, like, how is it that no one is saying that we, this is white supremacy that you have every single state except Hawaii, this majority white right now? And that is not a fluke, that is by design. People were run out of those states where they were from by white terror. They had majorities there. There, was, there were times when Native Americans were majorities of what would become states. And they were, run, they were chased west. Uh, uh, there, were, there was a time when some of the Western states had much larger percentages of Hispanic people. That was kind of their territory. So the idea that we, the American people, by design, chased people using white terror into spaces where now none of them have a majority of the spaces where they would have been majorities anyway, that seems to be not a problem. <laughs> but advocating that black people might one day be one percentage point over 50% in a state, not 90 plus percent like those seven white states that I was talking about, just 1% over 50, that freaks people out. We have to interrogate why that sounds like a problem to people. Charles Blow, the uh, book is called The Devil You Know. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate it.